Today is the, the first Sunday of Epiphany, and I mentioned that in the prayer. And, and Epiphany, if you stop and think about the word itself, we know that Epiphany is kind of a sudden revelation or a sudden recollection or a, a sudden understanding. You know, oh, I had an Epiphany last night. That means I understood something. I had a thought, I understood something, or, or I had this revelation come to me, I, I now understand something. That's what the term means, Epiphany Sunday. But you know when I asked Google at home, and, and then I asked Siri at home, so I, I'm a very high-tech person, and, and I said, hey, Google, what is Epiphany? And, and she told me, and Siri said the exact same thing. They were reading from the same script. It said, it is the sudden, um, it is the, the manifestation of Christ to the Magi. And, and I thought that was an interesting question, an interesting answer from, from Google and from Siri, that they would totally skip the accepted definition of the word epiphany, I had a sudden revelation, I had a sudden understanding, and, and went straight to the Christian definition. Um, but in Christian circles, that word is the time that we, the day that we set aside to remember uh, the visit of the Magi, the visit of the three wise men. And, and we do that because it's the first time that Gentiles recognize Jesus as the Messiah. The first time non-Jews see Christ as a Messiah. So we know that Christ came for all people. And the epiphany is proof of that. Uh, because the wise men from far, far away who were not Jews came to visit uh, on that day as well. Now there's a lot of old traditions that talk about the visit of the wise men, a lot of legends uh, concerning that. Um, Scripture doesn't give us an awful lot of information, but, but there's a lot of legends that, that kind of add a little bit more. Uh, for example, um, one story tells us that, that the star, after leading the wise men to the house that they were in in Bethlehem, that upon fulfilling its mission, it fell from the sky and landed in the well in Bethlehem. Kind of a cute little story. The story goes on to say that, that if you are pure in heart, you can stand at that well and peer down into that well and still see the twinkling of that star. Only if, the pure, only if you're pure at heart. Now, I, I don't know about that. It's kind of a pretty story. Um, kind of makes you feel warm inside. But I'm, I'm not sure we can believe it, right? Uh, there's other stories about the wise men. For example, how many wise men were there? Anybody? Anybody? We don't really know, do we? Huh? Twelve? A lot of people in, in the older Eastern church, older legends say that there were twelve. Um, we don't know. A lot of people today think there's three. Most divinity people, most pastors today would agree that there's three. We know that there were three gifts, but we really don't know how many people there really were. Um, like I said, some believe there were twelve. Uh, in fact, there's an old legend that, that, that tells us that there were three that even gives us the names of the three. Melchior was the oldest of the three, had this very long white beard, um, very old, gentle, wise man. He gave the gift of gold. Uh, Belshazzar uh, also had a beard but was not quite as old as, as Melchior. He gave the gift of myrrh. And then Casper was the youngest of the three, probably very young. He didn't have a beard perhaps too young to grow a beard, we, we don't know, he gave the gift of frankincense. So these are all traditions, they're all stories, we don't really know how true they are. Um, they, they might add a little bit of color to the story, but um, there, there's another legend that tells us that after seeing the baby in Bethlehem, that they, it said they went home by a different route in the Bible, but, but there's a legend that says that they went home by uh, a very circuitous route and, and actually wound up in Spain telling people that they went as far east as, uh, yeah, as far west as Spain before circling around to go back home again, just telling everybody what they saw and testifying to the Christ. Um, you know, we don't really know. We, these stories bring the wise men a little bit more to life. We can better relate to them a little bit maybe, but, um, but sometimes... These stories add a little bit of color to the story that doesn't, to a story that doesn't really need more color. Um, 
And, and as a result, they can get in the way a little bit. Um, in, in fact, sometimes the legends are so colorful and they add so much to the story that, that they kind of make the whole story unbelievable, kind of like the star that fell into the well and can still be seen today. Uh, it's, it's, it, might not, it might sound warm and fuzzy, but, but the reality is uh, it, it's, it's probably impossible to happen. So, so we can write off that part of the story, and if we're not careful, we might write off the whole story. We, we might find the whole story unbelievable. So it might make... It might make it more believable, it might make it more colorful, it might make it more unbelievable. So I, I think we need to be careful with, with stories and legends that aren't in Scripture. I'm not out to ban those legends, I think sometimes they can be helpful. But, but I would like to say that it might be helpful to read the story one more time as we have it in Scripture. So, so let's look at our reading this morning, it's from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And it reads, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the prophets, all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly And found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Let's pray. Father God, as we dig a little deeper into that passage this morning, I pray, Lord, that you'll open our hearts and minds to what you have for us there. May our thoughts and the meditations of our hearts and, and my words uh, be truly be acceptable to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So it all started sometime after Jesus was born. It might have been a few months. It might have been as, as many as two years. We remember that when Herod tried to kill the children after the Uh, after the Magi went on a separate way, that he killed all the child two years and under, according to the time that he got from the Magi. So so it could have been as much as two years before that that star appeared. So Jesus could have been as much as two years old at this point. Um, Apparently, Herod wasn't exactly sure how long, uh, even though he had asked the Magi how long that, that star had been there. But one thing we do know about the time is that there was a little bit of unrest at the time. There were rumors, and I've mentioned this before, there were rumors that, that a new king was coming that was going to rule the whole world. And, and there were rumors all the way from the Orient, in, in present day, in, in China, all the way through Persia, uh, Babylon, all the way, Jerusalem, the Roman Empire, all of these countries were, were aware of this prophecy, this prediction that there was going to be a king that was born that was going to, be, that was going to rule over the whole world. And, and Herod, I'm sure, was familiar with those predictions, with those prophecies. It was causing quite a stir. And, and I suspect that's why Herod reacted the way he did. He was a little upset and, and disturbed. With all of this tension and, and all of this stuff in the background and all of the world awaiting this king... And Herod, knowing this king was going to be the Messiah, was going to be called 
the Messiah. I, I find it, and I, I mentioned this on, on uh, Christmas Eve, I, I find it very interesting that the Magi never attempted to go to, to Bethlehem, or the Herod never sent anyone to go to Bethlehem to find out if, if what the Magi had said was true. He, he'd never sent anybody. Bethlehem is about two miles away. It's about an hour walk. Um, they call it a Sabbath day walk. Uh, you could do it on a Sabbath day. It was so short, you could even do it on a Sabbath day. It, it was maybe an hour away. A- and yet, Herod didn't send anybody along with them to see if what they said was true. Herod was obviously concerned about it. And, and we see how concerned later when he orders the death of all those children. But, but why did he not send somebody with them? Uh, What I find even harder to believe is that the chief priests and the teachers of the law who were called in by Herod to ask ask him about the Messiah, and they said he's going to be born in Bethlehem, and why didn't they go to check it out? I mean, of all people, the chief priests and the Pharisees, probably teachers of the law, were probably more anxious for this coming Messiah than anybody else. Why didn't they go see him? Why didn't they go with the Magi? It's an hour walk. Why not go see if it's true? And, and yet, none of them made, made the trip. God was so close, and they missed him. God was so close, and, and they were too busy to make the trip to see if it were true. I, I guess we probably can't be too astonished at that, because I think often in our lives, God is so close, but we're so busy that we miss him. Our schedules are so busy that we have to hurry up to the next place. And we can't pause and and look to see that God was was in our midst. God is so close, but we're in too much of a hurry. We have things to get done. And and honestly, this isn't very flattering, but I think that sometimes we're just too self-absorbed in what we're doing to notice that God is in our midst. And, and that doesn't sound good, but, but I'm afraid sometimes it's true. Uh, we get too concerned with our own agendas to worry about what God might be doing in our midst. And, and it's almost the definition of irony, isn't it? The one person who could help us out of our busyness is in our midst, and we're too busy to seek him out. I think in great literature, there's a genre called tragedy. I think that applies here. Um, It's a tragedy. Anyway, after a short delay, the wise men leave uh, Herod. They leave Jerusalem. They're back on the road. And and just maybe, maybe just around an hour later, they arrive in Bethlehem and they find the baby. Uh, The star reappears and guides them to the very house that he's in. Now, at this point in the story, uh, I, I... I think we lose a lot of people. They say, how can a star way up in the sky lead us to the very house that Jesus was born in? You know, sure, if they're a thousand miles away and they see a star in the sky, it gives them a general direction to walk to. So we get that part. The first part of the journey, it's easy to understand that the star might be leading them in a particular direction. But when they get close to Bethlehem, how can it point out the very house that they're in? And and you know what? I don't know the answer to that. I, I don't know. I've seen in Christmas uh, movies that there's a beam of light that came down out of sky pointing to it. For all I know, maybe that happened. Or maybe, as as the wise men followed the star, they just kind of intuitively knew. All I really know for sure is that God led the magi to the baby in the the particular house that, that they would find him in that God led them there. And he used the star for, for much of that journey. Maybe he used other things later on. I don't know. But I know that it was God that led them where they needed to go. Um, God shows us the way too. He often shows us what we should be doing. He shows us how to live the right life. Uh, and, and we see these things happen during the course of the day, that, that situations that come up and we just sort of intuitively know how to do it. Where does that come from? Sometimes things have happened and people have asked me, how did you know what to do? And I said, I don't know. I just sort of knew. Folks, that's how God works. 
That's God. When, when we get that sense of, of what we need to do, that's God pointing us in the right direction. And, and oftentimes I, I have people come to me for counseling or something and, I, and we talk about them and I, I ask them, what do you think you should do? And, and they usually don't have any ideas. Sometimes they do. But if it's not covered by something we see in Scripture, like if, if a pregnant teen comes to me and wants an abortion, that, that's, that's an easy one. Scripture says, um, or, or if somebody's so mad at his friend he wants to kill him, that's easy. We, scripture says, but there's an awful lot of things that come up that, that Scripture doesn't seem to give us a lot of guidance. And I always tell people to take time in those decisions and pray. And pray every day for 30 days. And the answer will become clear to you. I said, just try to come up with all the alternatives, all the different things that you could do, and pray for them. And at the end of 30 days, you'll know which one you're supposed to do. Because only one is going to stand up. God's going to bring that out in our hearts. And, and God does that. All the time God does that. Even if we don't spend those 30 days praying, often God lets us know. He just puts it in our heart what we're supposed to be doing. And, and I suspect that's how the wise men found the house that Jesus was in. God just put it in their heart and they knew where to go. We can't explain how God works. But we've all had divine fingerprints in our lives. Footprints filled with grace where, where God was with us and he pointed us in the right direction. He told us what to do. Trust yourself in times like that. Don't trust yourself that you're going to know what to do. Trust yourself that you're going to hear God in those times. Trust that God is going to direct you as you pray. Trust yourself that when you have a difficult decision and you don't know what to do, that God can answer that prayer. And he can point you in the right direction. And he can give you guidance. You may not hear him audibly, but you'll just have a feeling in your heart you'll know what to do. Back to the Magi. We don't really know where the Magi were from. Um, there are legends, again, that, that point to Persia, somewhere near current-day Turkey or, or Iraq. Some say as far as the Orient, which was China. We don't really know where they were from. But, but one thing we do know is that the Magi were not Jewish. The Magi were what was considered Gentiles, anybody but Jewish. They were Gentiles. But God led them to the, to the child. They went to see the baby Jesus because the baby Jesus would be their king too. Even though they weren't Jewish, Jesus was their king too. And, and I think that, that reminder in the Christmas story, that, that's a reminder that Jesus is, is king of all people, that, that Jesus is savior of all people. He's our savior, he's our king, that even though he was never a political figure, he, he was and is today prince of peace and king of all kings. And, and he's our prince of peace, and he's our king of kings as well. And I think the Magi remind us of that. Two final thoughts on the gifts. First, you, you read through the story, and, and this may not occur to you, but the Israelites never brought Mary and Joseph any gifts, did they? They never brought Jesus any gifts. Um, in fact, the Jewish people seemed to reject him at first. Um, obviously, they re rejected him 33 years later, but, but they, they didn't, for the most part, other than a few shepherds, nobody came out to see him. No Jewish people brought gifts. Um, yet these magi from very, very, very far away brought very, very, very expensive gifts the chief priests and the teachers of the law stayed in Jerusalem. They didn't even come. Yet, yet these magi from far away brought very expensive gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh, gifts that were valuable enough, incredibly invaluable, to, to help finance this couple's trip to Egypt. 
and then back their early years in Galilee. You know, Mary and Joseph weren't terribly wealthy people. They were probably fairly poor people. They didn't have the means on their own to finance a trip like this. But, but God provided. God provided. And, and you know, God provides for all those who trust in him, who love him, and, and seek to do his will. The Magi with their gifts showed us that. God took care of Joseph and Mary and, and the baby Jesus. He provided for their needs early on. He'll, he'll provide for our needs too as, as long as we love him and we trust him and we seek to do his will. Uh, it, it's pretty bizarre that while the Jews didn't pay any attention to Jesus' birth, the Magi from far, far away came with what they were gonna need for the next step in their life, for that trip. Came with such expensive gifts. It shows that sometimes God provides for our needs in ways that we never see coming. I mean, who would have thought, who in Jerusalem would have thought that, that wise men from who knows how far away would come with all the things that, that this baby would need for the next several years of his life the Lord sure works in strange ways, doesn't he? So the first of those two additional thoughts about the gifts is, is where they came from. They came from somebody that nobody would have expected to bring gifts. They came from, from non-Jews, perhaps thousands of miles away, um, because they were needed, and God knew they were needed. And the Jews weren't going to provide, so God found somebody else to provide. So that's the first thought about the gifts. The second thought is, is the idea and the gift itself of myrrh, that gift of myrrh. Uh, myrrh is, is an interesting choice of gifts because myrrh, while it was very valuable, it really only had one purpose. It, it was used to make perfume, but the kind of perfume that people used to prepare a body for burial. It wasn't the typical gift you might give a baby or a family for that matter. It, it was a gift that you almost always used to prepare a body for the tomb. I think it's interesting because at Easter we like to say that Jesus was born to die for our sins. And a lot of times we get so caught up in the joy and the beauty of the Christmas story and, and what the couple did and the precious baby in the manger that we lose track that the baby came to die for our sins. And then smack dab in the middle of this beautiful Christmas story is the gift of myrrh, an expensive perfume used to prepare a body for burial. At Christmas, with all the celebrations and stuff that happens, it, it's easy to forget. But it serves as kind of a stark reminder in an otherwise wonderful story Kind of a glimpse of the crucifixion in a story of new birth. God's story of the Magi is a story that God is close. It's a story that shows us that, that while God's own stayed home, God provided in another way. It's a story that reminds us that Christ came for all people, not just the Jewish people, but all people who will accept him. It's a story that reminds us that that incredible little baby in the manger came to die for all of our sins. Because this child, through this child, our sins can be forgiven and we can be made holy in God's sight. Let's pray and then we'll have the praise team come up and we'll reconvene at the table. Father God, we thank you for the story uh, not just of the wise men, but we thank you that you included that part of the story because it can teach us a lot of things. It, it can teach us that even though we're not Jews, <clears throat> that, that Jesus came for us as well. It reminds us that, that even though it's a beautiful story of a baby in a manger, uh, we're reminded that Jesus came to die for us. It's a story that reminds us of your incredible power, your incredible provision, and your incredible love. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen.